Warning, this episode deals with crimes committed against young children. It may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. As a new decade dawned in 1990, parents across southern Scotland and the north of England were unusually sombre and bereft of the excitement and promise which such an event typically brings. The source of their melancholy was the same in every household. These families had found themselves living in the grips of fear due to a spate of child murders across the region in recent years. These attacks followed the same distinct pattern. A young girl would go missing, then, at some point in the future, their lifeless bodies would be found large distances from where they had been abducted. All the victims were found to have been sexually assaulted. Staffordshire and Leicestershire police had, in response to two of the suspected victims of this killer, Susan Maxwell and Caroline Hogg, set up a task force to hunt the perpetrator down. As the scope of the manhunt went national, this progressed into a coordinated task force consisting of six police forces, which was to be headquartered in Wakefield, a city within Yorkshire, England. The task force chased down thousands of leads, but by July of 1990, they were no further forward in identifying the man responsible. All they had was their profile. The team had surmised early on that this was a man who likely worked as a lorry or van driver, or as a sales representative, which allowed him to travel freely around the country. They also surmised that due to the circumstantial nature of many of the murders, he was an opportunistic attacker who did not extensively pre-plan his attacks. Their profile was further enhanced by the FBI who stated that their killer would likely fall within the following parameters. White male aged between 30 and 40, likely closer to 40, who was a classic loner. This offender would be unkempt in appearance and had received less than 12 years of formal education. He likely lived alone and rented accommodation in a lower middle class neighbourhood. The motive for the child killings was sexual. The offender held a fixation with child pornography that he retained souvenirs from his victims. He most likely engaged in necrophilia with his victims' bodies shortly after their death before disposing of them. Other than this, and the 500,000 index cards they were working through within their home's database to assist their inquiries, the team had nothing. That changed on July 14, 1990, when David Herx, a 53-year-old retired postmaster from Stow, a small village 25 miles outside of Edinburgh in the Scottish borders, was cutting his front lawn beneath the summer sun when his gaze was attracted away from the task at hand. Out of the corner of his eye, he seen a blue van slowing down to a near crawl across the street. The vehicle then drew to a complete halt and the driver exited. He then began to clean his front windscreen by hand. As he was cleaning, David Herx noticed his neighbour's six-year-old daughter, Mandy Wilson, come bounding down the street, lapping up the freedom that only summer in a small town can give to children, even in trying times such as these. David returned to his work, mowing the remainder of his grass. As he knelt down to clear the cuttings from his lawnmower, he seen what appeared to be the feet of the young girl being lifted from the ground. David shot upright. As he stood, he spotted the driver of the blue van forcing something into the passenger door before getting into the driver's seat and speeding off. However, he no longer seen Mandy Wilson. David Herx quickly put two and two together. He noted the registration plate of the vehicle and ran to his neighbour's house as fast as his legs could carry him. Once there, he shouted out to his neighbour that their six-year-old daughter had just been taken from the street by a man driving a blue transit van. I'm Jess, and this is Skinwalker.
Robert Black was born in Grangemouth on April 21, 1947. He was what was then known as an illegitimate child, being the son of Jesse Hunter Black with no registered father. Grangemouth is a town most known for its petrochemical plants which can be seen for miles around, giving the town a gritty industrial feel. Robert's mother placed him up for adoption within weeks of his birth and he was placed into the care of social services. By six months old, he was placed with a foster family in Kinloch Leven, a remote town of around 1,000 inhabitants set amongst rugged natural beauty in the Western Highlands. His foster parents, Jack and Margaret Julep, were well thought of members of the community aged in their 50s. They had fostered numerous children previously. However, despite their influence being viewed externally as positive, their young ward Robert struggled to make friends in the area. This was compounded by his aggressive nature. The children who grew up around him in Kinloch Leven referred to him as being a bully, especially towards those younger than him. The only friends he ever did make tended to be substantially younger than him and he would use his physical advantages over them to intimidate them into towing the line that he set. One former classmate recalled a story whereby Robert launched a vicious attack on a younger child who also had a prosthetic leg for no other reason than mere boredom. He was also a distinctly unclean child. Despite Margaret Tulip's stern reminders on cleanliness, Robert held no interest in his personal hygiene. This led to his classmates nicknaming him Smelly Bobby Tulip. However, whatever Robert lacked in interest for hygiene, he made up for in his obsession with genitalia. While it had started as mere fascination, having shown his body parts to a young girl of the same age and her having shown her body to Robert, by the age of eight, his interest had transformed into compulsion. At only eight years old, Robert was regularly inserting foreign objects into his anus and leaving them there as he went about his day. He carried this practice with him into adulthood. Tragedy, it must be said, marred the life of the young Robert. After being abandoned by his mother to the care of the state, then shipped up to the Western Highlands as an infant, Disaster struck once more by the age of five when his foster father, Jack Tulip, passed away. After this, the young Robert developed an incessant habit of bedwetting. Later in life, he stated that he was beaten for each bedwetting offence by his foster mother, Margaret. Robert blamed the bedwetting on a recurring nightmare he had of a monster in a cellar full of water out to snare him. Tragedy struck again in 1958. Robert was struggling with life as it was when his foster mother Margaret Tulip then passed away. He was moved into another foster family in Kinloch Leven. However, after dragging a local girl into a public lavatory and committing a suspected sexual assault, his new foster family demanded he be returned to the care of social services. Robert now with no foster family and no existing relationship with his biological family, returned to a mixed-sex children's home, Reading's Children Home near Falkirk, only three miles from his native Grangemouth. While there, Robert's personal hygiene remained a significant issue and his general behaviour worsened. An officer of the council who reported on Robert at the time described him as, quote, a dangerous spirit. He was still being referred to as Smelly Bobby, regularly exposing himself to the girls in the home and, on one occasion, an investigation was called due to an attempt to sexually assault a young female who happened to walk by a field near the home. Black and two of his friends from the home had seized the girl, who was of a similar age to the trio. They then forcibly removed her underwear and attempted to rape her. None of the trio managed to sustain an erection, so left the survivor alone in tears in the field. When interviewed in later life about this incident, 
Black was asked whether he believed this specific incident to be consensual. He replied, I was forcing her. There was allegedly some level of reporting of this event to the police. However, the investigation did not lead to any criminal investigation or charges. Although, Robert was subjected to internal discipline for the sexual assault and attempted rape and was transferred to a new high-discipline establishment named Red House Care Home in 1959. Red House Care Home was an all-boys residential home located in Musselburgh, just outside of Edinburgh. While there, he attended Musselburgh Grammar School and within his school reports, it was noted that he appeared to be slightly above average academically, despite retaining a reputation as a bully. He also took a keen interest in participating in sports, particularly swimming, which he excelled at during his time at Musselburgh Grammar. Hidden beneath the surface of this upturn in his behaviour and presentation was the fact that during his three years within Red House Care Home, Robert was repeatedly sexually abused by a male staff member. The way in which the abuse started further confirmed to the young Robert what he had already started to believe. Sex was about power and dominance. The abuser had a previous victim in the care home prior to Robert. However, he was approaching the age at which he would no longer be a ward of the state. As such, the abuser demanded that prior to him leaving the care home, he helped select the abuser's next victim. The boy picked Robert. By the summer of 1962, at the age of 15, Robert could leave school and was forced to leave the Musselburgh care home and the clutches of the abuse. Authorities, cognizant of letting a troubled youngster out in the world with no assistance at the age of 15, helped arrange a job for him as a butcher's delivery boy in Greenock a town in the west of Scotland, around 80 miles from his previous Musselboro residence. It is unknown if his youth offence record reflected the attempted rape, which Black and his accomplice were internally disciplined for in the Falkirk residential home, or if the home's investigation even lay on file, given there were no formal criminal charges raised. Nonetheless, Robert Black began his new life unshackled of his previous caretaker's purview. Robert appeared to be a diligent worker and was trusted to complete deliveries by himself early on in his employment. He quickly realised the opportunities which this new freedom brought. His fascination with genitals, his own sexual abuse and his troubled upbringing had culminated in a twisted compulsion to molest young girls and his unfettered day travelling the coast and delivering meat offered him ample opportunity. Robert would stop his delivery van whenever the opportunity presented itself to talk to young girls. He primarily targeted those who were on their own. Once he had isolated his victim, he would attempt to fondle them and would commit a sexual assault if given the chance. This harassment went unreported for over a year. Robert Black estimates there are at least 30 survivors of his early abuse within Greenock, whom he had pursued in this way. None of these survivors have ever reported Black. It was, however, only a year later, in 1963, that he would first come to the court's attention, this time for an attack committed against a young girl. This attack took place on an evening in mid-1963, Black, then still only in his mid-teens, sat in a local park in Greenock and watched on as the local children played. He noticed one seven-year-old girl who had been left isolated by the others. As she sat playing on her own, he made his way over to talk to her. Black quickly befriended her and gave her a push on the swings. After this, he asked the girl if she would like to see some kittens. As she agreed, he led her to a local deserted air raid shelter. On the way to the shelter, the pair walked past a policeman. Oblivious to the danger the 16-year-old posed, he merely passed the pair by. Given their ages, he perhaps thought they could have been brother and sister. Once in the air raid shelter, 
black immediately rounded on the girl and forcefully grabbed her by the neck. Using his hands, he manually strangled her until she was unconscious. He then molested her and after he had finished with his molestation, began to masturbate over her. Black callously walked out of the shelter, leaving the young girl for dead. The survivor was later found wandering the streets bleeding and crying, with a subsequent doctor's investigation discovering she had suffered a ruptured hymen during the attack. The survivor was able to identify Black the following day, and he was arrested for lewd and libidinous behaviour. He was slated to stand trial later that year. As part of the pre-trial, Robert Black was sent for a psychiatric report. The findings of this report stated that the psychiatrist who had interviewed Black did not believe this incident to be part of a recurring pattern of activity. It further stated that Black appeared to feel genuine remorse for his crime. Taken together, this was likely to be an isolated incident and Black would not pose a significant risk to the public should he not be imprisoned. The courts were significantly less stringent on sex attacks in the 1960s and Black was given an admonishment for the offence and faced no legal repercussions for his actions. A secondary report was commissioned by the local social services department which took a somewhat dimmer view of his actions and demanded he leave the area. He then returned to Grangemouth to make a fresh start. There is no mention as to whether the social services in Greenock made any attempt to alert Grangemouth of the danger in their midst. Once in Grangemouth, he lodged with an elderly couple and got a job at a local builder's supply company. One night, while at the local youth club in Grangemouth, Robert met Pamela Hodgson, a local girl with a pretty face and a kind smile. The pair courted for a number of months, with Pamela unaware of Robert's background. Within several months, Robert was entirely smitten and proposed. Pamela said yes, however, in a twist of fate, she broke the engagement off with a letter alleging his sexual proclivities and need spelled the end of their relationship. He carried hatred of this rejection with him for the remainder of his life. By 1966, a then 19-year-old Black's activities would again be in the spotlight. He had begun molesting the nine-year-old granddaughter of the landlord that he was lodging with and she had reported him. The young girl had complained to her parents that when at her grandparents' house, their lodger, Black, had molested her. The elderly couple decided, as many families wrongly did in this era, that in order to spare their granddaughter from further trauma, they would evict their guest and not take the matter any further. Sweeping abuse under the carpet remains a shaming hallmark in previous generations. Robert Black had once again escaped unscathed. After losing his job at the Builders Supply Company, he moved back to Kinloch Leven. He had begun to lodge with a married couple who had a six-year-old daughter. Within one year of Black living with them, the couple discovered their daughter had been repeatedly molested over a one-month period. This time, there was no sweeping under carpets. The parents immediately informed the police and Black was arrested. After pleading guilty to three counts of indecent assault against a child, he was sentenced to one year in Pullman, Boston. This Boston, just outside of Falkirk, specialised in training and rehabilitating serious youth offenders. In later life, Robert Black spoke freely of his time spent in different care homes and even the abuse which he suffered therein. However, he refused to discuss his time at Pullman, Boston stating only that after his period of incarceration in such an institution, he vowed to never be imprisoned again. Black was released from his Boston sentence in the spring of 1968. In September of that year, he moved to London 
and found lodgings in a bedsit close by to King's Cross Station. Over the next two years, he worked in various casual jobs, one of which employed his childhood swimming talents in his role as a swimming pool attendant. Wherever Black went, abuse followed. While he was employed at Hornsey Swimming Pool in London, a complaint was lodged against him that he had inappropriately touched a young girl. Once again, no formal charges were brought against him, although he was relinquished of his duties. While living in London, he discovered a bookshop in King's Cross where he was able to procure child pornography. Black would go on to amass a large collection of magazines and videotapes of the worst type of abuse imaginable, even going as far as travelling to Amsterdam and Denmark to add to his collection. By the mid-1970s, Robert successfully gained a driving licence. He had driven in his youth, but no one had bothered to check his credentials. He used his licence to gain employment as a delivery driver for a poster company in Hoxton, London. Poster Dispatch and Storage, his employers, delivered posters across the UK, Ireland and Europe. Robert Black's willingness to take long-distance deliveries pleased his employers, who spent much of their time managing the needs and wants of their married employees, who did not want to spend the time away from their families. The single loner, Robert, felt no such compunction to remain at home. Travelling large distances daily in his delivery van. Inside his van, he also kept a number of masturbation aids and women's clothing which he would wear whilst he masturbated in the back of the vehicle. Robert began to develop a knowledge of the transport network throughout the UK, a knowledge that he would later use to enable him to commit a series of heinous crimes across the length and breadth of the country. On July 30, 1982, in Tweed, England, Susan Clare Maxwell began the two-mile walk home from her tennis game in nearby Coldstream, which lay in Scotland. The family lived on one of the closest towns to the border between the two countries. She had asked her mother Liz earlier that day if she could take her bike rather than being dropped off or taking the bus. Liz was concerned. Susan was only 11 and that meant a different level of maturity to Liz than it did to Susan. In the end, her mother compromised allowing her to travel by herself outside of the village for the first time, provided she walk rather than take her bike. This was agreeable to Susan, and elated and victorious, she took off out of the door. The hem of her yellow dress, the last thing her mother seen as she crossed the threshold of their home. She followed a pre-designated route, which would enable the eyes of the helpful locals to be on her all the way. On her way, a local offered her a lift, which she accepted. Together with the helpful local, she crossed the border and met her friend, Alison Rayburn, at the tennis club. Liz decided to pick her up after thinking it was a terribly hot day to walk the distance twice and play tennis in between. However, after she arrived at the tennis courts, Susan was nowhere to be seen. After being unable to locate her anywhere nearby and having found out Alison had arrived home safely, Liz and her husband Fordyce decided to call the police. As the police began their inquiries, they discovered that Susan was last seen around 4.30pm, crossing the River Tweed Bridge. No one reported seeing an abduction. The following day, a full police search was mounted 300 full-time officers were assigned to the case and the force used search dogs in a bid to track Susan down. One area of interest was that of Cornhill on Tweed. The area is an artery for the local road network both north and south and several locals reported seeing a white van sat in a lay-by just off of the road on the day of Susan's disappearance. No evidence was found in the area 
and the van was never located. Despite extensive local search parties and police work, the trail went cold. What the police were unaware of is that the van was Robert Black's and Susan's disappearance was no mere coincidence. Almost two weeks later, on August 12th, a lorry driver named Arthur Meadows discovered the body of a young girl off the A518 road in Utoxeter, a town in the Midlands of England which lies over 260 miles from Cornhill. The body was in a state of decomposition and had been covered with branches and undergrowth. The young girl was fully clothed save for her shoes and underwear. Her underwear had been placed beneath her head. She had been bound and gagged. Despite the advanced state of decomposition, the body was confirmed to be that of Susan Maxwell through dental records. Later investigations would reveal that Robert Black's delivery schedule for the day of July 30th would have seen him travel through Cornhill on his way to complete deliveries throughout Scotland. He stayed overnight in Glasgow and then travelled home the following day. Given the location of her discovery, it is assumed that Susan Maxwell must have lay in the back of Robert Black's van for over 24 hours, dead or alive before her body was dumped in Cornhill. As Black made his return journey to London to complete his shift, the police continued extensive investigations into the crime, determined to see justice for the Maxwell family. But despite a staged reconstruction, extensive re-interviewing of witnesses and canvassing of locals, their efforts did not result in a successful arrest. Given the failures of the investigation into Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, the police had collected extensive data on the investigation, resulting in over half a million informational cards being held within their database for the investigation, named Holmes. Robert Black had gotten a taste for murder. Given his troubled upbringing, dangerous nature, and having walked away unscathed from his numerous crimes, Ever since he first attempted to kill in Greenock, it had seemed predestined that he would escalate. And he did. Just shy of a year after the murder of Susan Maxwell, Black travelled to Portobello, a suburb of Edinburgh in Scotland. In the early evening of July 8, 1983, a local five-year-old girl named Caroline Hogg disappeared while playing outside of her home. She had spent the afternoon at a birthday party and buoyed by the excitement and energy which fuels five-year-olds, she asked her mother Annette to let her have just a few more minutes of play at around 7pm. The family lived a few minutes walk from a local play park, so Annette said she could play for a few minutes in the swing park, but not to go any further by into Fun City, a large amusement park slightly further on. After Caroline failed to return home by 7.15pm, her family immediately panicked. They searched the surrounding streets, upon which a young boy informed them that he had seen Caroline with a scruffy man on the nearby promenade. They ran over to search, but found nothing and informed the police of Caroline's disappearance. The search that ensued was the largest in Scottish history at the time. 2,000 local volunteers, along with 50 members of the Royal Scots Fusiliers, an infantry regiment of the British Army, all searched Portobello before expanding their scope to all of Edinburgh. The Hogg family made a tearful plea on national television for the abductor to return Caroline. However, as no news was forthcoming, they never spoke to the media again. By July 10th, Caroline's disappearance made headline news across the UK. It was then discovered that nine known paedophiles were identified as having been in Portobello on the day of the disappearance. However, all were eliminated from the investigation. Eyewitnesses came forward to report citing an unkempt and balding man wearing horn-rimmed glasses watching the young girl as she had played before following her 
a nearby fairground. A 14-year-old girl named Jennifer Booth came forward to report what she had seen on the day. She had seen Caroline talking to the man as they sat on a bench and she had overheard Caroline reply, yes please, in response to the man before they walked off towards the fairground. The question posed by Black is not known, but some eyewitnesses stated they seen the man pay for Caroline to ride the carousel as he watched, before a reportedly frightened looking Caroline walked off holding hands with him. This scruffy man was, of course, Robert Black. On July 18, 1983, the Hogg family's worst nightmare was realised. Caroline's body was discovered in a ditch nearby to the A444 in Leicestershire. This location was over 300 miles from Caroline's home, yet strangely, the police noted, was only a short distance from where Susan Maxwell's body was discovered. Given the coincidence, the forces of Northumbria, Staffordshire, Edinburgh and Leicestershire teamed up to pool their resources as they were the four areas in which the crimes had either been committed or the bodies of the victims disposed of. After following a number of bad leads, the task force quickly became overwhelmed. There was also a further victim to investigate. Sarah Harper was a bright and cheery 10-year-old girl from Morley, near Leeds in England. At 8pm on March 26, 1986, her mother Jackie asked if she would do her the favour of picking up some food from the local store, which lay a couple of hundred feet from their house. Sarah took the money from Jackie's hand and promised to return quickly with the bread. She was spotted leaving the shop at 8.05pm. However, she had not returned home by 8.15pm and Jackie began to worry. She asked one of Sarah's sisters, Claire, to go out and look for her. When Claire came in without Sarah, she packed the entire family into the car and began searching frantically. With no sign of her daughter, she alerted the local police. By April 19, Jackie's misery was confirmed. She had received a call from the police that she would receive a visit. Her ex-husband Terry was called to the station. He was asked to identify a body. Describing what he seen as, quote, worse than anything I had ever imagined, he nonetheless confirmed the body discovered was his daughter. Sarah's body had been recovered from the River Trent in Nottingham, over 70 miles from her home in Morley. It had been discovered by a passing dog walker who had dragged the body which was floating in the shallows into the bank with a stick. Initially, the task force did not believe the murder of Sarah Harper to be linked to those of Caroline Hogg and Susan Maxwell due to some differences in the MO and differences in appearance between the victims. They seemed to ignore the fact that again the body of Sarah Harper had been discovered in close proximity to that of Susan Maxwell and Caroline Hogg. Eventually, a change in emphasis brought the investigations together and the murders of the three victims were publicly linked and the investigation centred on bringing in one man responsible for all three murders. The police were given a further lead after an attack on April 23, 1988. Teresa Thornhill, a 15-year-old girl from Radford in Nottingham, had attended a get-together with friends in a local park along with her boyfriend, Andrew Beeston. After spending time with their friends, the pair had decided to head home for the evening. They walked along Norton Street before heading their separate ways. Teresa noticed a blue transit van slow down to a crawl ahead of her before eventually stopping completely. As she approached, the driver stepped out of the car and said to her, Can you fix engines? The overweight and unkempt man who had asked the question made Teresa feel uneasy. As she replied she didn't know, she picked up her pace and attempted to walk past as quick as she could. The driver of the van grabbed Teresa from behind, placing his arm across her mouth and nose 
as he attempted to drag her into the vehicle. Teresa kicked and shoved frantically as she attempted to escape the grip of the man. She then managed to grab him by the testicles as he screamed, You bitch! Andrew Beeston had gone back to check that Teresa had made it past the van and noticed the commotion. He ran towards Teresa and screamed, Let go of her, you fat bastard! Upon hearing this, Teresa's attacker immediately let go of her and ran to the driver's seat of the blue van before speeding off. The attacker had escaped, but Teresa Thornhill and Andrew Beeston were now able to give the police information on their attacker and the vehicle he had drove. It is unknown whether the police linked this crime to Black at the time, given the disparity with his known MO. Almost four years since the last murder, and two years since the last attempted attack, the police were, unknowingly, finally within touching distance of their man due to the watchful eye of David Herks. Having informed his neighbour of his daughter's abduction, one man set in motion a chain of events which over half a million information cards, the greatest minds in UK criminal investigation and an army of volunteers had spent years working towards. The capture of Robert Black David Herck's watchful eye was not the only fortuitous aspect of Black's capture. Black was unaware that he had been spotted abducting Mandy and opted to drive back through the village of Stow. With David having raised the alarm, an army of local police officers had descended on the scene. Mandy's father was in Kelso at the time and sped back to the village. As he spoke in panic terms to local police, and David Herks. Herks exclaimed that a blue van coming down the road was the same one involved in the abduction. The police made a move to intercept his vehicle. As he swerved, Mandy's father leapt in front of the van and Robert Black applied his brakes. Mr Wilson quickly tore through the contents of the van as Black announced his name to police and was placed into handcuffs. Mandy was found in a small opening behind a wooden partition thrust up in a sleeping bag with a hood over her head. Later, doctor examinations concluded that in as little as a further hour she may have died being held in such conditions. Her father removed her from the sleeping bag, untied her and removed the tape from her mouth. Stating her condition, he said, quote, She was fully conscious but petrified. You could see the heat in her face. She was red and sweating. Black was at the back of the van and in handcuffs. To this day, I have never heard his voice, but that image of him is still in my mind. Why Black had elected to return through the village rather than travel towards Edinburgh, as his vehicle appeared to do initially, is unknown. The fact that he did ensured that Mandy Wilson became a survivor of Robert Black rather than another victim. DCC Hector Clark was one of the most prominent members of the policing effort to snare the child killer and he felt he was close to finally giving the Hogg, Maxwell and Harper families justice. With the fresh evidence of the crime against Mandy Wilson, DCC Clark now believed the man responsible for the remaining three unsolved murders was in custody and that man was Robert Black. Clark had an immediate gut reaction upon seeing Robert Black, going so far as to state, except for the fact that he was bald, he was just as I expected. By that, DCC Clark implied that Black looked like a man capable of committing these crimes. Black was tall, fat and heavy set, dirty in appearance with a large belly and yellowing and cracked teeth. His head bore hair only on the two sides, with a bald reservoir prominent at the top. He had piercing blue eyes which appeared to stare through whatever he was observing. His skin bore deep frown lines and his black facial hair was unkempt and tinged with grey. His history and mentality too bore a striking resemblance 
to the psychological profile the FBI had compiled for the local task force, and the abduction of Mandy bore striking similarities to the MO for crimes against Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg and Sarah Harper. The FBI had stated that the offender would be a white male, 30s to 40s, a loner, unkempt in appearance, who had received less than 12 years of formal education. Robert Black was in his mid-30s when his crimes pre began, nearing 40 with his last successful murder and was 43 at the time of his capture. Having left school at 15, he had received around 10 years of schooling and his general appearance and attitude fit. The only aspect which never fit entirely was that the offender would live alone in rented accommodation. Black had, in fact, rented from and lodged with a family in their spare room for most of his adult life. The fact that Robert Black was their man was now a matter for the police to prove and a public prosecutor to convict. In August of 1990, whilst the investigatory work which would lead to trials for the murder of Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg and Sarah Harper were underway from the task force, Robert Black stood trial for the kidnapping of Mandy Wilson. Given the volume of evidence against him, Black entered a plea of guilty in an attempt to plea down his sentence. Lord Ross presiding gave no such quarter. Robert Black was sentenced to life imprisonment for the crime. As he sat behind bars, DCC Clark and his team were ensuring that Robert Black would never see the outside walls of a prison again in his life. There were investigatory choices other than to deep delve his entire life since the crimes had begun, as Black was refusing to talk. By routing through Black's employment records, delivery runs and fuel receipts, alongside interviews with his colleagues, bosses and those who knew him, the police had established a quote, substantial amount of circumstantial evidence against Black. However, they still lacked a kingmaker to guarantee a conviction, either in the form of DNA or a confession. Nonetheless, by April 1992, Robert Black was served with notice to prosecute in the cases of Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg, Sarah Harper and Teresa Thornhill. The trial took place in Newcastle Crown Court in the northeast of England and would be led by a fellow Scot in Justice William McPherson. Well aware of the media coverage of all cases, Justice McPherson warned the jury against being moved in any direction by suspicion, emotion or sympathy. The circumstantial evidence which the investigating team had gathered proved enough putting Robert Black within the vicinity of all of the crimes. It was entirely persuasive that it would be beyond the realms of possibility that another offender with the same MO, the same perversions and the same offence of odour, as described by Teresa Thornhill, would have been present within the areas of these crimes at the same time as Robert Black. In 1994, four years after his arrest in Stow, Black was finally found guilty of the three child murders, those of 11-year-old Susan Maxwell from the Scottish Borders, 5-year-old Caroline Hogg from Edinburgh, and Sarah Harper, 10, from Morley, near Leeds, as well as the failed abduction attempt on Teresa Thornhill in Nottingham in 1988. Robert Black looked on emotionless as the verdict was read out, just as he had been throughout the trial, As he was approached to be escorted out of the courtroom, Black turned to the detectives involved with the case who had been in the room to hear his sentence and stated, Tremendous. Well done, boys. He was then taken to Wakefield Prison where he was held in a segregation unit classed as a Category A prisoner. Whilst incarcerated, suspicion fell on Robert Black in relation to the murder of Jennifer Cardy. Jennifer Cardy was a nine-year-old girl from Ballanderry, Northern Ireland. On August 12, 1981, 
after having lunch with her brothers Philip and Mark. Her mother Victoria waved her off at 1.40pm as she cycled to a friend's house. Jennifer had only just gotten the red bike as a gift for her birthday two weeks previous. Several hours later, when Jennifer had not returned home as expected by Victoria, she began to worry. They soon found out that she had not made it the mile and a half journey to her friend's home. Her father Andy phoned the police at 9pm and news quickly spread throughout the community. Around 200 people joined the search for Jennifer and it was just before midnight when two men discovered her bike lying in a field off Crumlin Road just one mile from her home. The bike stand sat in the downward position suggesting that Jennifer had stopped to talk to her abductor. It had then been thrown over the hedge. At the same time in Northern Ireland, there were political issues and violence was regular in the area. May's prison, nearby, housed members of the IRA who were on hunger strike and bomb blasts were becoming part of everyday life for locals. These issues were put aside by the community as the search for Jennifer Cardi continued. Six days later, two anglers discovered her body in a reservoir in Hillsborough, County Down, around 15 miles from her home. The autopsy concluded that she had died of drowning, accompanied by strangulation. A forensic pathologist also noted signs of sexual abuse on the body and underwear of Jennifer. The watch that Jennifer had wore that day had stopped at 5.40pm leading police to believe the murderer had dumped her body in the reservoir within hours of her abduction. The location of the discovery of Jennifer Cardi's body is also noted as important. The A1 dual carriageway is a main route for long distance delivery drivers driving south from Belfast to Dublin or travelling back towards the capital. In a trial which finally ended in 2011, Robert Black was found guilty of the murder of Jennifer Cardi. Throughout the trial, police looked at up to 40 cases, with 13 of these possibly linked to Robert Black. One of the most prominent unsolved cases linked is that of Jeanette Tate. Jeanette vanished while delivering newspapers in Devon, in the southwest of England. The normal paper boy that day was busy, and Jeanette had stepped in to help out. While riding her bike, completing the round, she had by chance ran into two friends who she stopped to talk to. After chatting for a few minutes, Jeanette hopped back on her bike and rode on ahead. She would have remained in her friend's sight for around 50 metres before she rounded the corner. The two girls had walked slowly in the same direction that Jeanette had rode and soon discovered her bike laying at the side of the road with the newspapers spilled out of the basket. After searching the immediate area, they were unable to find Jeanette and went straight to the family's home. John and Violet Tate searched frantically before eventually coming to terms with the reality that their daughter was missing. Throughout his time in prison, pleas were made for Robert Black to confess to the murder of Jeanette Tate and end her family's heartbreak by revealing what had happened. Jeanette's body had never been found and Black refused to admit he had anything to do with it. Robert Black gave extensive interviews whilst in prison, despite being uncooperative with police. He informed one interviewer that he had never forgiven his biological mother after discovering she had married and had children, yet never once attempted to discover who he was or how he was doing. Robert Black died of a heart attack in 2016 at the age of 68 in Magaberry Prison, Northern Ireland. His death was sudden and he was described as being in good health in the lead up. After his death in Belfast, there were hearings to discover whether any family members wished to come forward and claim his body. No next of kin was ever discovered or came forward. There is no sure way of telling how many child abductions or murders Robert Black has been involved in. Black went to the grave without revealing any information relating to any of the possible murders linked with him. 
His work had taken him across the UK, Ireland and Europe and gave him ample opportunity to carry out his crimes across great distances. David Herx, the man responsible for reporting Black, was later presented with a silver hip flask with the engraving with our eternal gratitude from the Wilson family and the local community in Stow. They twice campaigned for him to receive honours for helping bring a 12 year hunt for the killer to an end, something which a multi-million pound police investigation had failed to do. However, both attempts were in vain. David himself stated that he has no interest in such things and the fact that Mandy was found alive and well and the police ensured Robert Black was brought to justice was enough to satisfy him. <laughs>